Welcome to the Parkland Institute's 24th annual conference, After the Contagions. I'm Pat Parody, and I am a board member of the Parkland Institute and executive director at the Center for Constitutional Studies in the Faculty of Law at the University of Alberta. Parkland Institute is very pleased to have hundreds of people joining us again this evening from across Alberta and the country for the last of the great keynotes in what has been a very successful conference. I want to start this evening by thanking all of our sponsors. Without their support, we could not have been able to host this conference. They are the Alberta Federation of Labour, the Alberta Public Interest Research Group, Athabasca University Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, Canadian Union of Public Employees, the Civic Service Union, Public uh, Local 52, Non-Academic Staff Association at the University of Alberta, the United Nurses of Alberta, the University of Alberta's Faculty of Arts, Wordsworth Irvine Socialist Fellowship Endowment, uh, and the Health Sciences Association of Alberta has also made a special contribution that will allow our keynote presentations to be edited and posted to the Parkland Institute's YouTube channel. So thank you. I also want to thank the media sponsors, Alberta Views Magazine, CJSR Edmonton, for their help in promoting the conference. Now, Parkland is an institute in the Faculty of Arts at the university, and so it receives some funding from the university, but it also very much depends on the support of individual donors, contributing organizations and unions to fund its important research and public programming. So we thank those of you, and there are many uh, who already support Parkland, and we encourage those of you who are able to contribute and have not done so, to please consider either making a one-time contribution or better yet, becoming a regular monthly contributor. You can click on the link on the chat if you are able to contribute and please do. The Parkland's excellent and critical research and public programming depends on your contributions and we need your support to continue and to grow our work. Now a few logistics for this evening. The chat feature uh, is available so participants can make comments to each other. Please note that neither I nor Thomas will be following the chat, but we do have staff who will be monitoring it to ensure that people are being respectful and adding in links and other information that may be of, of interest to you. For those of you who want to have a conversation on Twitter, please use the conference hashtag and that hashtag will be provided to you in the chat. Now, following Thomas's keynote presentation tonight, we will um, open the door for questions. You will see a Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. So please type in your questions and uh, make them as succinct as possible, please. There is also a thumbs up a sign, that, sign that you can use if you want to promote a particular question uh, that you think is particularly interesting or uh, is similar to a question that you would like to ask. Now, before introducing Thomas, uh, we want to begin this evening by acknowledging that the city of Edmonton is on Treaty 6 territory. We acknowledge and honor all the ancestors, their traditions, and the spirit of this gathering place that drew Indigenous people, the Cree, Nakota Sioux, Dene, Blackfoot, Métis, and then settlers who have enjoyed the benefits of the treaty to this special place. We acknowledge the spirit of this ancient and great gathering place in our river valley, in the heart of our city, that has for thousands of years been a peaceful and spiritual gathering place for trade, ceremony, and celebration. We acknowledge the traditions of trade and commerce that drew settlers here and enabled the forging of relationships that saw the creation of Treaty 6, the province of Alberta, and the city of Edmonton. And we acknowledge and honor that we still reside on Treaty 6 territory and together call upon those honored traditions and the spirit and intent of treaty to maintain us in a stronger and lasting relationship. And now I am pleased to introduce Thomas Homer Dixon. Thomas Homer Dixon is director of the Cascade Institute at Royal Roads University. He also holds a university research chair in the Faculty of Environment at the University of Waterloo. Between 2009 and 2014, he was founding director of the Waterloo Institute for Complexity and Innovation. And prior to that was the director of the Trudeau Center for Peace and Conflict Studies at the University of Toronto. Born in Victoria, British Columbia, Dr. Homer Dixon received his BA in political science 
from Carleton University in 1980. And in 1989, his PhD in International Relations, Defense and Arms Control Policy and Conflict Theory from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He then moved to the University of Toronto to lead several pioneering research projects investigating the links between environmental stress, violence in poor countries. Since joining the University of Waterloo in 2008, his research has focused on threats to global security in the 21st century, including economic instability, climate change, and energy scarcity. He also studies how people, organizations, and societies can better resolve their conflicts and innovate in response to complex problems. His work is highly interdisciplinary, drawing on political science, economics, environmental studies, geography, cognitive science, social psychology, and complex systems theory. Now, Professor Homer Dixon teaches undergraduate and graduate courses on topics ranging from environmental security to international relations and complexity theory. His academic writing has appeared in leading journals, including uh, Scientific American, the New York Times, the Financial Times. He now writes regularly for the Toronto Globe and Mail. His books include The Upside of Down, Catastrophe, Creativity, and the Renewal of Civilization, which won Canada's 2006 National uh, Business Book Award. The Ingenuity Gap, which won the 2001 Governor General's Nonfiction Award. And Environment, Scarcity, and Violence, which won the 2000 Caldwell Award of the American Political Science Association. His most recent book, which is the title of tonight's presentation, Commanding Hope, The Power We Have to Renew a World in Peril, he says took him eight years to write. And it was by far, he says, the most difficult book he has ever written. Hope, Homer Dixon says, is a difficult concept for anyone to wrap their head around in this modern context. So we look forward to hearing more about hope from you this evening. Welcome, Thomas. Thank you very much, Patricia. It's so marvelous to be with you all this evening in this somewhat bizarre circumstance where I have this piece of silicon contraption in front of me. I'm talking to you in, in, in your living rooms, in your dens, perhaps in your kitchens. So in some sense, we're intimately connected with each other, but also very distant. But there's hope, as we know, because... Uh, we have some new vaccines on the horizon, the news just in the last few days uh, about the Pfizer and the Mod Moderna and the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccines is very positive with extraordinary rates of protection, plus 90%. We now can see some light at the end of this tunnel, hopefully, and uh, can return to something resembling normalcy in a, in a few months' time, perhaps by the middle of this coming year. But hope seems to be something that we are clinging to at the moment, and it's the subject of my talk tonight. It's the subject of my book, as Patricia uh, pointed out. In this world where everything seems to be crazy, where we seem to have a new surprise, often an unpleasant surprise, often a very scary surprise on a day-by-day -day basis, uh, hope seems to be scarce or it seems to be under siege. And that's the topic I'm going to talk about tonight because I actually think hope is enormously important if we're going to have real prospects for addressing our critical challenges in the days, months, and years to come. So the title of my book is Commanding Hope, The Power We Have to Renew a World in Peril. There's the cover photograph. And if you want more information about the book, you can go to the website that's indicated at the bottom there. And there is a buy the book button, if you are so inclined. This book is a very personal exploration of the issue of hope. It's very much grounded in my experiences as a Canadian and as a, an ex experience as a Western Canadian, living and growing up in British Columbia, also putting myself through university by working in Alberta, in the Alberta oil patch during the 1970s. This is a photograph from our house on Vancouver Island, a house that's been in the family since the 1970s. On the coast, looking out across the Strait of Juan de Fuca towards the Olympic Mountains. This landscape is in my bones. And even though I went to Ontario and studied in the States and lived out East for 40 years, it's remained, remained very much part of my identity as a person, as a Canadian, and as fundamentally an environmentalist, this sense of connection to the natural environment. And it's an environment in which and through which I've tried to raise my children, our children, Sarah, my wife, and I have two, as you can see here. This is a photograph in 2012 taken 
on the southwest coast of Vancouver Island, a secret little beach that I've been going to for probably 50 years or so uh, since I was a child, more than 50 years, 55. So this is in 2012, and there's Ben standing on the gravel holding my hand. He was about seven at that time. He's now 15. And Kate on my shoulders was uh, three years younger, four, and she's now 12. And these children figure very prominently in the book. There are two significant stories that are part of a narrative arc for the book. I always try to connect my more academic arguments to personal stories when my books are for general audiences, trade books, as they call them in the business. One of the stories is the story of my children growing up. In fact, they grew up in many respects through the course of me writing this book, which took, as Pat said, almost eight years, extraordinarily difficult project. I started the book three times. Uh, twice, I threw out tens of thousands of words and returned in a sense to the drawing board. And in 2016, after the second episode of th throwing out a substantial amount of writing, I realized that the thing that gave me the most anguish and the thing that I felt I had to address most sp specifically in the book was the possibility that Ben and Kate would lose hope as they grew up and, in, and emerged as adults into a turbulent and possibly chaotic and even violent world. And so I realized that I, the project in front of me was really in the end to write a book for them that would explain why I think there are still real possibilities of hope and, what, and how they might organize their lives around these notions of hope going forward in a way that would allow them to persist and even flourish in a world that could be experienced great difficulty. This is one of two stories. I'll tell you something about the other story that is part of the narrative arc of the book as I get to the end of my slide presentation. Things seem to be very peaceful in those photographs. In most of Canada, we live a life still even during the pandemic that is peaceful and relatively secure, most of us. Uh, but the world does seem to be going haywire around us. There seem to be converging problems and challenges from every direction. And I'm sure you've heard much about those challenges in the course of your various talks this week. I identify a number, which I list here and I talk about in the book. So threats to humanity's well-being are multiplying and combining in force. These threats include population growth and demographic imbalances. The world's population will peak sometime this century, probably at 10 billion or perhaps even more people. While we see declining population growth, stabilizing population growth in some parts of the planet and even declining in some parts such as Europe, there are other parts where the population is growing still very fast, especially Africa. Africa can expect to see its population triple this century. And so that's going to involve a rebalancing of the human population extraordinary growth in some places and stabilization and even shrinking in other places. And that will tend to drive large migrations of people from one part of the world to another. We have worsening instabilities in key natural systems, such as the Earth's climate. I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Collapsing biodiversity from overuse of ecosystems and damage to ecosystems and also from climate change. Pandemics of infectious disease, as we're experiencing right now, economic distress during, due to technological change, financial shocks, and extreme and growing inequalities of wealth and opportunity. And then consequent on uh, many of these stresses, rising social polarization and populist authoritarianism, a consequence of many of the other problems, especially the economic distress listed above. And we've had very personal experience with many of these challenges despite the fact that in Canada, we've been enormously lucky and we still live in stable, secure society for the most part and our lives are prosperous. We've been seeing these creeping challenges and problems coming in from every direction. And sometimes they're very stark and sudden and disruptive. The fires that we've seen in Western North America in recent years, a photograph here from Okanagan in 2018, but again, in 2020 in Oregon, Washington State and California, uh, extraordinary fires blanketed much of the west coast of North America in thick smoke, blowing out as we see here on September 12th into the far into the Pacific in a vast vortex. And then as the wind shifted, blowing back across the continent, across Alberta, affecting the air quality in your province, and then across eastward across the continent out into 
the Atlantic and Europe and eventually literally circumnavigating the globe. These are problems that uh, cross boundaries as everybody acknowledges now and no constraints in terms of the sort of institutions and the laws that might govern them. They, we can't stop these things at particular political and legal boundaries. The pandemic has a similar kind of transnational or global impact. And it's of course caused extraordinary disruption in our lives over the last months. Unprecedented change really in terms of speed and scale between middle of March and the middle of April this year, almost 4 billion people on the planet locked down. We probably haven't seen a change of that magnitude so quickly of such a large fraction of the human population ever before in human history, which actually might be a reason for, uh, for hope or a sense of positive possibility in the future, because if that many people on the planet can change their behavior so fast in response to a, a threat, maybe there are other things we can change in terms of our behavior to chart a new direction into the future. As I mentioned, large migrations of people around the planet are causing enormous hardship for the people who are migrating, but also destabilizing in many cases, the societies in which the migrants live, where unfortunately, in which the migrants or to which in which the migrants arrive, where unfortunately the recipient populations are not, often not terribly accommodating and don't greet these incoming refugees and migrants with uh, open arms. And in many cases, as we see here in Greece, people end up being uh, contained or corralled into massive refugee camps and in absolutely miserable conditions along the boundaries of wealthy societies. In this case, the camp was uh, subject to arson in this period of time in September, and the people had to evacuate and ended up living on a highway to almost 20,000 people. And the social polarization I mentioned, it's not in incidental or coincidental that the concerns about injustice, about inequality, about exploitative or oppressive power relations within our societies have risen to the surface during the pandemic at a time when marginalized communities or racialized communities have uh, suffered much more severely in many cases from the economic impacts and the health impacts of the pandemic. And it's produced during this past summer, extraordinary protests to try to, to get elites within our societies, Western societies, and especially in the United States to address these power and economic and wealth imbalances more effectively. So all of these changes that I've just identified have contributed to a a circumstance or a situation of rising fear within our societies, not just within the United States and Canada, but really around the world. And this fear has been exploited by some leaders to galvanize their followers and to build their political power. Of course, President Trump is exhibit A for those of us in North America, but this has been happening all over the world with President Bolsonaro in Brazil, with President Duterte in the Philippines, with Viktor Orban in, in Hungary, uh, with Vladimir Putin in Russia, the use of fear, the exploitation of fear and we, they attitudes, divisions and polarization within society in order to build political power and sometimes try to overturn democratic institutions or constrain a democratic institutions is now very widespread all over the planet. And we're seeing a increasing migration of some segments of our population, some communities in our populations to somewhat euphemistically be called populist authoritarianism, perhaps more bluntly called fascist tendencies with uh, very strong expressions of violence, advocacy of violence in some communities. So in this kind of environment and in this kind of psychological and social situation, what role can hope play? And that's really the question I ask in my book. Hope might seem like a rather weak read in response to these extraordinary forces, forces and tendencies. But I argue that it's essential. It's an essential starting point. It's actually a necessary condition for progress on any of these problems. It may not be sufficient. It certainly isn't sufficient in itself. Hope is not going to solve the problems in itself. But we can't have the agency and the sense of possibility to address these problems together unless we have hope. So... It may be essential, but it's complex. After I realized in 2016 that I needed to write my book about hope, and that was going to be its focus because of my concern about 
my the possibility of my children losing hope in the future. As I started to understand hope better and read about it, I realized that it's an enormously complex topic. And the first third of the book actually uh, unpacks some of the best thinking in, lit in the scholarly and psychological and philosophical literature about hope and tries to build a theory of hope around which we can have a, a more positive view of the future. So hope may be essential, but it's complex and it needs to be far more than a hopey, changey thing. Some of you may recognize that quotation. It's from Sarah Palin, who is John McCain's running mate in the 2008 presidential campaign, presidential election in the United States. They were campaigning against Barack Obama, of course, if you remember in those days, Barack Obama built his campaign around the possibility of hope, the audacity of hope. Sarah Palin and John McCain lost the election, of course, but in 2011, she stood up in front of a large group of Republicans and said, so how is that hopey, changey thing going for you? I think she put her finger on a common critique or common sense that hope really isn't up to the job that a lot of people give it or may not even be useful. There are actually three common criticisms of hope that I identify in the book, uh, that hope is false, that it's naive and that it's passive. And Sarah Palin was in a sense capturing all three in her, in her uh, criticism of the idea of hope in, in front of that Republican audience. Hope is false, these critics would argue. There are many very thoughtful critics of the emotion of hope saying that we shouldn't really invest much energy in it or invest much time in trying to cultivate hope. In part because they, some of them would say it's false because it, it encourages us to distort or bias the possibility of good things happening in the future to believe that they're more probable than they actually are. That hope is naive, some would argue, uh, especially when hope doesn't have a clear object, a clear uh, vision of the future uh, that it's striving towards. And then others would argue that hope is passive uh, because it sort of encourages us, they would say, encourages us to, to sit back and hope things will simply turn out better, hope that a better world will come to pass. And I think there's some legitimacy to all three of these criticisms, but I also argue that uh, we can, in a sense, take charge of hope. We can command it, make it do our bidding to a certain extent. It's an emotion that is within our control, and we can reimagine it to be a much more powerful emotion that will help us address the challenges we face. The title, Commanding Hope, is a double entendre, and that's intentional. It, the kind of hope that I'm suggesting we should adopt, it, it commands our attention, but it's also a product of our agency. We can actually shape hope into a form that will be extraordinarily useful for us. And this reimagining, I say, has to move along three pathways, I guess you could say. We need to respond to the idea that hope is false by anchoring it in a notion of honesty. So we need honest hope. We need also to respond to the idea that hope is naive by making our hope astute. And we need to respond to the criticism that hope is often passive by making our hope powerful. So commanding hope has three components, honest hope, astute hope, and powerful hope. The book is an extended argument for each one of these three and shows how each, each of these components of hope, honest, astute, and powerful, can be brought together into this notion of commanding hope. Honest hope is really, in some sense, a moral stance. It's an attitude towards truth. It's a commitment to an honest understanding of the reality that we face and the challenges, even if they're extraordinarily difficult, the challenges that we face. Astute hope is what I would call an epistemological stance. It's about the kind of knowledge we need in order to address our challenges effectively. And powerful hope is a psychological stance it's, it's about the kind of psychological attitude, especially the notion of agency that we should have as we try to address our serious problems as, a, as societies and as a species. So I'll spend a few minutes going through each one of these components of hope so that you can see how I, at least an initial argument for each of these, how I develop each of these components within the book. So let's start with honest hope. There's a deep tension, I argue, between hope and honesty especially in dangerous times. 
the challenges we face, for instance, climate change may seem so large and we all each individually feel so small that our first reaction might be to simply throw up our hands in despair. We're living in dangerous times, whether we're talking about climate change or uh, collapsing biodiversity or massive migrations or social polarization and decline of democracy and widening economic gaps between us. And we're often lying to ourselves about how serious these problems are with the help from our leaders. It's extraordinary how our leaders manage to tell us that they've got the climate change problem under control, for instance, when they simply don't. But that allows us to pretend that the situation is not so bad, and then we can get on with our lives and try not to worry about things so much. The heart of this challenge of honest hope, I believe, is something that I call the, on, the enough versus feasible dilemma. When it comes to a problem like climate change, and we could describe this dilemma for each one of those problems I listed at the beginning of my presentation, but when it comes to a problem like climate change, solutions that would be enough to make a real difference aren't feasible. And yet, on the other hand, solutions that are feasible, that we might actually be able to achieve, won't be enough. Solutions that are enough aren't feasible for, because there are social or political or economic or technological obstacles in the way. And those solutions that won't meet such serious political, social, technological, and economic obstacles won't get us to where we need to go. So this enough versus feasible, feasible dilemma is really fundamental and we need to recognize it and acknowledge it and then try to address it if our hope is going to be honest. I'm gonna talk about the enough versus feasible dilemma for just a few minutes in the context of climate change. The climate change issue figures very prominently in my book all the way through. It's an issue that I've been working on since the 1980s, since I was doing graduate work at MIT. About uh, 18 months ago, I produced this chart using uh, data that are available from the scientific literature. Uh, it, it's a version of the infamous hockey stick graph, but it goes further back into the past and it's well grounded in verifiable scientific data. In this case, we're looking at the, the uh, temperature at the Earth's surface, the tropospheric temperature of the Earth, uh, going back to 11,300 years before the present. So that's at the end of the last ice age. And then going from that left-hand side, uh, the little circle there to the right, up to the present, you see another little circle that's labeled present. And the red line indicates the changes in that tropospheric temperature for that whole 11,300 years. This is a period that geologists and climate scientists call the Holocene epoch, since the end of the last ice age up to the near present. You can see that during that period of time, the temperature has varied about 0.7 degrees Celsius. And in the last 2,000 years on the right-hand side of the graph, the period of time during which human civilization, humankind built out the basic infrastructure of its civilization, the established its great cities and ports, developed its major agricultural zones, built its transportation networks and irrigation systems and the like. During that 2000 years, uh, the temperature varied about 0 0.5 degrees Celsius. It was a period of enormous climatic stability, but we're already well outside that envelope, as you can see from where the little present circle is, and we're going vastly outside that envelope if we continue along the current trajectory of, emit of carbon emissions and greenhouse gas emissions. Already we're seeing enormous disruptions around the planet as evidenced by those wildfires that we've been experiencing in Western North America and, the, and uh, storms and other climate extremes all over the planet. If we go beyond up to two degrees and beyond, people need to realize that uh, there isn't a single ecosystem on the planet that can withstand that kind of stress. And beyond two degrees towards three degrees, it's hard to envision that anything resembling modern liberal democracy would be sustainable. Among other things, it's going to be very hard to feed the 10 billion people on the planet in a climate that's changing so rapidly, where scientists expect we will start to see simultaneous breadbasket failures in multiple places around the world as the, as the climate produces severe storms and droughts that affect our global food system. So this is a really an existential threat to human civilization, if not to the species as a whole. I mean, there were probably from for many millennia into the future be human beings around, 
but it's hard to envision anything resembling a prosperous, flourishing human civilization in a world of three degrees or more. And it's gonna be a real challenge even at two degrees. And two degrees is really where we have to try to stop things, as you know, from the conversations about climate change. But the challenge is that the technologies and social and political and economic changes that would actually get us to two degrees don't seem to be feasible. Uh, they require deep structural changes in our economies, new, new tax regimes, new kinds of technologies that although they may happen eventually, don't seem to be likely to happen soon enough uh, because in significant part of opposition from key vested interests, especially in the fossil fuel industries, don't seem to be likely to happen soon enough to prevent us from crossing that two degree threshold. So while we know what we need to do to get to enough, to get to a, a situation where we can cap warming at two degrees, those particular solutions don't seem to be economically, politically, socially, and technologically feasible. We can capture this in terms of a simple Venn diagram where we have all the solutions that might be enough to cap us cap warming at two degrees and all those solutions that are feasible, but not enough to cap us at two degrees. One has to wonder at the moment whether these two subsets actually overlap. There's a funny cartoon that I use in my book that uh, makes the point in a very pithy way. Here's a woman standing at the door, looking out through her, her door. Or she's just looked out and sees fire beyond the door. And she says, so apparently changing to energy efficient light bulbs wasn't enough. We're not even close, even under the Paris Accords, to achieving cuts in carbon and greenhouse gas emissions that will keep us around two degrees Celsius. If you add up all the cuts, even if all the countries actually abide by their current commitments, we don't cap warming under about 2.5 degrees Celsius. So we're not getting to enough. So the challenge then for honest hope is trying to find out if there are sets of solutions that are both enough and feasible. If we're going to sustain honest hope, we have to focus hard on identifying sets of solutions in this overlap zone. A big part of my book is about trying to stretch our imaginations in a way that will allow us to find those solutions. And I'll come back to that towards the end of my presentation. So that's a quick introduction to the idea of honest hope. What about astute hope? Now, astute hope is really about the kind of knowledge we have in order to justify our hope and actually have some prospect of addressing the problems we face, such as climate change. And in this case, I argue that we need a particular kind of knowledge. We, have, we need to be better informed about the way people see the world, especially they see their social and political and economic situations, what social scientists would call people's political ideologies. In the book, I introduce this relationship between worldviews, institutions, and technologies. This is based on some research that came out of Columbia University in the late 2000s, in 2009, under the leadership of the economist Robert Costanza. In a wonderful article that appeared in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, his team suggested that societies organize themselves around what they called WIT sets, W-I-T sets. The W for worldview, the I for institutions, and the T for technologies. The idea is that these combinations of worldviews, institutions, and technologies are sort of the basic building blocks of society. If we really want to create change, we have to work on all three of these things simultaneously. A simple example that I introduce in the book is this relationship between personal liberty, free markets, and private cars. In our Western societies, we have a deep commitment to personal liberty, to individual freedom, and that is expressed through and reinforced by free markets, or at least partially free markets as we conceive them within capitalist societies. And those free markets have allowed the growth and flourishing of industries that generate private cars. And those private cars in turn allow us to exercise what we regard as personal liberty by having extraordinary mobility by historical standards. And that's an example of what we would call a wit set, this relationship between our worldview commitments to personal liberty, our institutional commitments to free markets, and our technological commitments to private cars. I argue in the book that if you want to try to break into this cycle, yes, it's true that in the end, we have to work on all three simultaneously, but the place to start is with worldviews. And I have an extended argument for why that's the case. I argue that the greatest possibility for rapid change that can initiate or catalyze 
a, a sharp shift in the direction that humanity is taking is with worldviews. And I try to introduce, or I do introduce some tools that allow us to think in a more focused and analytical and precise way about worldviews. One of them is called cognitive effective maps. This is a mapping technology to represent belief systems that we developed at the University of Waterloo in the 2000s over the last 15 years or so, originally suggested by the philosopher and cognitive scientist Paul Thegard, who is a member of our research team at the University of Waterloo. And I introduced this and another method called state space modeling that anybody can use to better understand not only how they think about the world and how they understand the world, but also how other people understand the world better. Because I argue that better conception of our own understanding and a better understanding of other people's understanding will allow us to more effectively work together to solve our problems, to identify groups and individuals who might ally with us as we mobilize politically to address problems like climate change, and also will help us understand much more fundamentally what the basic reasons are that our opponents don't agree with us. While we may not be able to convince them to change their minds, having a much more accurate understanding of why they disagree with us and, and why they are potentially dangerous will allow us to be much more effective in the political challenges and the political contests that we will face in the future to achieve change. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about cognitive effective maps in a moment and show you a couple of examples, but they are a tool by which we can have more astute hope, hope that's more richly informed of the nature of the beliefs that other individuals have around us. And the final component of commanding hope is what I call powerful hope. This is a, a psychological attitude towards the future. It's about having a clear object, a clear sense of what the possibilities are in the future and what kind of world we want, what kind of positive future world we want that gives us a sense of agency and motivation that allows us to push through our difficult times. And at the core of powerful hope is shifting the, our locution for hope, the way we talk about hope from a locution that is that emphasizes hope that something will come to pass to a locution that emphasizes hope to make that outcome come to pass. It's common for us to think of hope in a very passive way. We hope that climate change will stop at two degrees, climate warming will stop at two degrees Celsius. Instead, I argue that powerful hope as a component of commanding hope has to be a hope to kind of hope. We actually have, hope, have to hope to do what's necessary to keep uh, climate warming to two degrees or under. The hope to locution is always followed by a verb because it's a very active notion of hope. And so powerful hope is a hope to notion of hope. And it needs to have a clear idea of what that future is, what it is that we want to achieve. It needs to have a clear object or vision of a desirable future. If it's followed by a verb, hope to is followed by a, an active verb then we need to have a clear vision of what actions we're taking with our agency to achieve a desirable future. And I try at the end of the book to develop a, the beginnings of a vision of that future. And there are two components to it. I start with an argument for three basic injunctions that really basically create a floor below which we don't want to go in our thinking about what our future is going to be like. So as we try to build this vision of a positive future, we need to commit ourselves to three basic injunctions. Don't wreck our planetary home. Don't commit mass suicide by fighting among ourselves. And finally, protect our children. We need to be able to commit to at least this amount to move forward. And at the moment, we're not doing any of these three things effectively. And we're certainly wrecking our planetary home. And in the process, we're not protecting our children. And if we continue to go down this pathway, we're probably going to end up fighting among ourselves to the extent that we commit mass suicide somewhere later this century. This is a starting point for our vision of the future, but it's not sufficient by itself, in part because you can't build an, an emotionally energizing vision of the future around negative injunctions, such as the first two bullets there. We need something more positive. And that's where four principles that I talk about in the last chapter of the book come in. Principles of security, opportunity, justice, and identity. 
I argue for the first three, security, opportunity, and justice. If we look across human society, there are three fundamental personality temperaments. There are people who are fundamentally prudential, who are concerned about insecurity. And if they are going to commit themselves to a new vision of the future, that vision has to provide them with a sense that the future will be secure. So we need to be able to articulate a notion of security in our vision of the future. There are people who are, have a, a tremendous sense of agency and exuberance and want a lot of, of opportunity and elbow room for the expression of that agency. And so our vision of the future has to make a profound commitment to a notion of opportunity that will allow those people to express and exercise that sense of exuberance. And then finally, there are people who are enormously empathetic and committed to justice and fairness uh, with the, and the groups and the people around them. And those people have to see within the vision of the future that kind of fundamental commitment to justice. Now, it's true that no one of us is exclusively one of these three temperament types. But I think that it's remarkable overall how much each of us is pulled in one direction or the other. We all have a combination of all three of these impulses, one might say, or temperamental characteristics. I argue in the book that there is this, this tendency for human beings to cluster in, the, in each of these three areas. And so our vision of the future needs to appeal to all three of these basic psychological or temperamental communities in humankind. And then the fourth principle that is going to be fundamental to our vision of the future is a very powerful notion of identity, a notion of identity that brings us together around a conception of common fate. And this is an argument that I make in the context of climate change, but it also is very relevant to the situation we faced with the pandemic. We're on a very small planet now, and a lot of us packed together. And as we found in March and April, when 4 billion of us were locked down, things can happen on one side of the planet that move very fast and affect us all in very dire ways, uh, almost immediately. And one thing that is becoming very clear from the climate change problem is that there's really nowhere to go on this planet to escape the problem. In the last part of the book, I write about this issue, in fact, because I'm regularly asked by people who are becoming concerned about climate change, where can I go on the planet or in the country when things start to fall apart? Should I go north? Should I go to New Zealand? Should I go to the Great Lakes area where there's water? And my response is there's actually nowhere you can go to escape from this problem. We're all together in this very small area now, this very small planet. So we're either going to live together and solve these problems, or we're going to not solve these problems, and we're going to die together. Those who escape to New Zealand, for example, with, their, with all their wealth and try to build their gated facilities down in New Zealand in their private airstrips and all the like, will just have a few more decades to be able to witness everything unraveling around the world around them. This notion of common fate is very powerful and it's an unusual situation we face on the planet now that it's very explicit and very clear at the very time when we're all connected together uh, tightly through information and trade and energy and material linkages. And we also simultaneously have a very clear scientific understanding of the nature of the challenges we face in a way that earlier societies that faced existential challenges, for instance, during the Black Death, in Europe didn't really have, that those societies, the people in those societies didn't really have a clear understanding of the nature of the challenges they faced at the time. And we do, we have a scientific understanding, we're tightly connected together and communicating together and we have a very clear sense of shared fate. I argue in the book that this notion of species-wide identity is absolutely essential if we're going to pull together to address our problems. And I developed some arguments for how I think we can build that sense of identity around the planet. In the last few minutes of my presentation, I just want to talk about two visions of the future and how we might try to move towards a positive vision instead of a very negative vision. And this is an argument that I develop through the book, but especially develop it in some detail in the last part of the book. I suggest that we have a potential contest emerging between what I call a, a Mad Max worldview, what I articulate or suggest in terms of a positive vision of the future as a renew the future worldview. This is a, an image from Mad Max, the most recent Mad Max movie, Mad Max Fury Road, which gives you a sense for what this vision of the future might be like. One 
involving fundamental struggles over scarce resources, uh, deep we they divisions, and potentially an enormous amount of violence. And what I do in the last part of the book is I lay out what a cognitive effective map might look like for a Mad Max vision of the future, what the concept of the future might mean for people who adopt this kind of worldview. And just so you know what you're looking at here, all of the concepts that are surrounded by hexagons have a negative emotional valence. They might be characterized by an emotion that we don't feel positively about, such as anger or hatred, fear. The concepts that are surrounded by ovals are characterized by a positive emotional valence. So you can see that the notion of the future in the Mad Max worldview is strongly negative, and it's linked, as you can see, to these uh, other concepts of danger and decline and scarcity and loss, and the they group and the enemy. The dotted lines indicate contradiction or a lack of concordance between those emotional valences. And so you can see that there's a very strong tension between the negative emotions surrounding the concept of the future and the positive emotions surrounding the concept of we, which is defined territorially protected by borders and authority and violence against outsiders. Now contrast this with the renew the future notion of the future. And here the future is not an emotionally negative concept, it's an emotionally positive concept. The notion of hope that I articulate, which is linked to honest knowledge about the challenges that are faced, a strong sense of agency, is also that, that notion of hope buffers the future from the dangers, the emotional dangers that are on the left-hand side that are characterized by violence and scarcity and authoritarianism. The future is it's linked to a vision of the future with those principles of opportunity, safety, and justice, a global identity, a global we identity, and fundamentally a concept rebuilding nature of creating the conditions in which nature can flourish, renewed, rather than being grievously damaged by our economies and our behavior as it is right now. So this is a radically different conceptual and emotional worldview uh, uh, in contrast to the Mad Max worldview. And, and this is how I articulate what I see as a potential positive vision of the future that will mobilize our powerful hope as a component of commanding hope. We need to reach a social tipping point before we reach a planet, planetary one, says Will Steffen, who's a renowned systems theorist in Australia. I think that we have the possibility through worldview change of reaching a social tipping point. Worldview change can happen potentially very quickly and human beings have shown the capacity during the pandemic to change their behavior very quickly as I was arguing at the beginning of the, my presentation. We can use our imaginations to expand the set of feasible solutions to incorporate more of the set of enough solutions so that we have solutions that are both feasible and enough. And I talk in the book, all the way through the book, about this second story. Uh, it's the story of Stephanie May. It's a story in some sense of every person is an example of what an individual can accomplish by using their imagination to stretch the feasible set so that big solutions become possible so that we can get to enough. Stephanie May was a kinetic housewife in the 1950s, more or less single-handedly mobilized mothers around the United States to oppose the testing of nuclear weapons in the atmosphere. During the 1950s, of course, the superpowers, the United States and Soviet Union, were testing hundreds of atomic and hydrogen bombs in the atmosphere and saturating the atmosphere with radioactive materials that were bioaccumulating in food and potentially causing leukemia in children around the planet. Stephanie May was appalled by that possibility. She learned as much as she could about the science. So she grounded her activism in a realistic understanding of the situation, honest hope, one might say. And she mobilized mothers with the help of other mothers across the United States through petitions and hunger strikes. This is a hunger strike that she launched outside the Soviet mission in the United Nations in New York. She was instrumental in creating an international movement of mothers that helped propel the negotiations surrounding the Partial Test Ban Treaty in 1963, which put all testing of nuclear weapons underground and produced a very quick drop in the amount of radioactivity in the atmosphere. Here, Stephanie May is addressing a crowd of 100,000 people in Trafalgar Square 
1961 at the end of the Aldermaston March from the nuclear research station at Aldermaston in the U United Kingdom. She was a remarkable woman and her hope was a very good example of what I call commanding hope. It was honest, astute and powerful. And just a little interesting sidebar here, that little girl who's standing beside Stephanie is Elizabeth May, who went on to become the leader of the Green Party in Canada and one of Canada's principal environmentalists. So there's an example of stretching the feasible set to make uh, something that very important enough, which in that case was the partial test ban treaty, the uh, movement of all nuclear tests underground. We've seen another example of stretching imagination in just the last few years. If somebody had said in 2017 that a girl of 14 or 15 years old was going to sit on the steps of the Swedish parliament building with a knapsack and a sign calling for a school strike and that she would mobilize tens if not hundreds of millions of people around the world to engage in climate action, we would have said that was a ridiculous idea. And yet Greta Thunberg did it. She took that possibility that was just beyond the boundary of what complexity scientists would call the adjacent possible. She took that possibility and pulled it back into reality so that it became real and has started to change the world. What other possibilities can we not yet imagine just beyond the boundary of the adjacent possible that are still invisible to us that could perhaps be pulled into reality and could change our world? Virtuous cascades of change start in our minds, I argue in the book, in our worldviews and then become political. And political action is ultimately what it's going to be about if we want to change the, the structures of power, the rigid structures of power that sustain current dysfunctional ways of running our economies that are damaging our natural environment so severely. And this mission, uh, this endeavor is now encapsulated in an institute that I recently founded here at Royal Roads University called the Cascade Institute, which basically takes uh, many of the ideas developed in the book Commanding Hope and puts them into practice to try to identify high leverage intervention points that could shift human civilization away from a path that leads to calamity and towards one that leads to fair and sustainable prosperity. In the last sentences of the book, I argue for this. I say, let's not aim for what's merely feasible and falsely hope it will be enough. Instead, with commanding hope, let's aim for what we'd all consider enough a future in which our children and life on this planet can flourish and then strive to make that future our reality. Thank you very much. And I look forward to now having a conversation with you about hope. Right, thank you so much for that talk. Uh, after this week, we, we needed uh, some hope actually, uh, Thomas, so thank you. Now, I just wanna remind people that uh, you can ask questions using the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. Just hover your mouse over it and then type your question in. Please try to be as succinct as you possibly can so that we can get to as many questions as possible. We won't be able to probably get to them all, but we'll get to as many as, as we can. So I'll begin then with a question from Bob Aska. How do your views complement or differ from Jonathan Haidt's work on morality, religion, and politics? Yes, very good question. So I'm quite familiar with Jonathan Haidt's work and I cite his work in the book. Jonathan Haidt suggests that we have human beings share uh, a series of uh, fundamental moral impulses. And these impulses are pretty well universal, although some individuals will select a subset of those moral impulses and, and will be more motivated by those, whereas others will, uh, will select perhaps an, another subset or maybe exhibit uh, more comprehensive motivation but from all of those moral impulses. They include, for instance, an impulse to fairness, to prevent uh, harm uh, to other people, uh, an impulse for loyalty, an impulse uh, uh, to protect things that are sacred, an impulse for freedom and, or liberty. This is very important research. It's grounded in an enormous amount of cross-cultural anthropology and social psychology. You can see it, hints of it in the background of my three temperaments argument. Those with an exuberant temperament tend to have a much stronger moral impulse towards liberty. Those with a uh, empathetic temperament, uh, the ones who are committed to justice that I was suggesting in Hadian terms would have a 
moral impulse towards uh, fairness or prevention of harm. I think that social psychologists and anthropologists and moral philosophers have actually done a very good job, and psychologists have done a very good job of discerning some of the underlying uh, sources of human morality. And I draw on that quite explicitly within my own work. The way I link, though, my argument to that work is by saying that our vision of the future has to allow people to see themselves in that vision. It has to allow them to express their own personal, meaningful uh, life projects through that vision. I think Haight argues quite well those ideological perspectives that allow for the incorporation of a larger set of moral impulses are going to be perhaps more persistent, more powerful, more accommodating for whole societies. Agree with that point. Normally, I'd go back and forth and have a conversation on this point, but I don't think I get a chance to actually exchange any any further ideas with Bob on this unless he wants to have a follow-up. And just to conclude, I think this research is really important. Our, Our notion of where we want to go as a species needs to be informed by our understanding of how human beings think and where their basic values come from. And there's one other point, that's what was on my mind that I wanna make. And this is an argument I haven't talked about. It's in the book at length, but I haven't mentioned it in my presentation so far. Uh, I draw on the work of Ernest Becker, who is a anthropologist and social psychologist who wrote a renowned book in the 1970s titled The Denial of Death. And Becker and subsequent social psychologists who built on his work argue that one of the most profound and powerful human motivations is fear of death. We deal with that fear of death by uh, creating for ourselves what, what we could call hero stories or immortality projects that allow us to see ourselves symbolically transcend our, our, our mortal existence on this planet. We might raise a family or build a business or write a book or be a a really good member within our religious community, even just be a terrific friend. But each one of these ways, we see ourselves as being more than just a a mortal, frail, physical entity that that will eventually disappear from the world. So we create meaning in these ways. And I argue that, and this is where, again, I link to hate, that our vision of the future has to allow people to express their own personal immortality projects within that vision, because that's what will give us the real sense of motivation and agency to, uh, uh, to have powerful hope. So all of this stuff links together, the, the arguments from Jonathan Haidt, from Ernest Becker and Sheldon Solomon and the terror management theory folks and many, many others link together in my argument in the book, come together into this notion of a positive vision of the future which I call Renew the Future, and which I showed you in that cognitive effective map. Wow, thank you for that answer. Uh, now, this question is from Minal, uh, Minal Sh- uh, Shrivanastava. We don't have buy-in from the majority of the planet's population because the mainstream summation from the left or the right of the present and the future of the world does not take into account the lived realities of the many millions who live in inner cities, reserves, slums, shanty towns, refugee camps, etc. The stories of their resilience against the cycles of daily survival and violence barely feature when we consider global solutions to planetary problems. Perhaps aside from honest and astute, hope also needs to be more inclusive? Well, exactly. In fact, I have an extensive argument to that effect in the last chapter of the book. This notion of justice that I try to articulate in chapter 20 at length is an inclusive notion of justice. I suggest that we can't really hope for security to secure security or to secure opportunity if we don't address first and foremost justice, which means fundamentally addressing incredible insecurity of the majority of the human population. And we can't hope to build an inclusive identity when there are such profound divisions among us either. There's no real way forward ultimately that doesn't involve some kind of redistributive project on the planet. And it may not be one that can be supported by really vigorous economic growth, because the kind of economic growth that we've had up to this point doesn't seem to be compatible with protecting the planet's climate or its ecosystems, because very high levels of material throughput and pollution output do enormous damage to the climate and the ecosystems. 
at the least, we need a radically different notion of growth, or even we have to try to uh, deal with our problems of justice in the absence of uh, anything resembling economic growth. It's not clear how we do this. I'm very frank in the book that this is in some sense, some, one of the, the most intractable problems humankind faces. Uh, in, in the absence of conventional economic growth, how do we deal with problems of injustice? How do we deal with problems of insecurity that affect such an enormous part of the human population? The notion of justice that I articulate as a part of our vision of the future is, a, is an inclusive notion. And this notion of identity, a species-wide sense of we, is an inclusive notion of identity that we have as individuals, as a wealthy individuals in an extraordinarily wealthy society, a commitment to an identity with those individuals in much more constrained and insecure circumstances in the inner cities, in indigenous territories, in ecologically degraded environments all over the planet. And here's the lesson of the pandemic. It goes back to this issue of shared fate. If those folks are part of this larger community and don't have the opportunity for security and opportunity and, and justice that I would talk about in my vision for the future, then we won't be secure, we won't have opportunity, and we won't have justice either, ultimately, uh, because this, again, is a very small place. Their insecurity and their problems, as we found with the pandemic, will ultimately become ours. And this may seem like a pie-in-the-sky notion, and I address that directly, but I actually think it's grounded in, in a very realistic understanding of what we need. Just to make one last point, I point out that in my travels around the world, and probably many people watching this evening have traveled across many, many countries. I've traveled in probably 60 or 70 countries and done research in, in a dozen or more, very different societies. The one thing I've noticed is that those societies that do well they usually have a deep and strong cultural commitment to the common wheel. There's this sense within the society among rich and poor and everybody, there's a strong sense that there is a larger societal project or national project of which people are part and that everybody has a responsibility to each other within that project. It's one of the striking differences between the United States and, and Canada right at the moment. And it's, our, and it's instantiated through, for instance, through our commitment to national health care. Those societies that do well have a cultural commitment to the common wheel that crosses all social sectors. We need that at the global level. And without it, frankly, we don't have a hope. What's the possibility? I think the pandemic shows us that there is at least a, a chance of a worldview shift towards a notion of the shared fate that could draw us together in a very powerful way around this planet in coming decades. We are the one. That's right. Who would have said we could all change our behavior like that? Four billion people in three weeks. Unbelievable. We're paying attention now to everything that's happening on the planet, right? We've got the first COVID war in the Horn of Africa right now. If we ultimately don't deal with this coronavirus in every corner of the planet, it's going to mutate and come back. A tough lesson. People may think is not imaginable. People say, has this ever happened before? Well, there's at least been one other episode in human history. A great German existential philosopher, Karl Jaspers, identified in the middle of the last century and called it the Axial Age, a period of time between about 600 BCE and 200 BCE during which five independent civilizations on the planet all went through a kind of ontological shift, a cosmological shift in their understandings of the world. These civilizations weren't communicating a lot with each other, but they all went through this shift kind of simultaneously. It laid the foundation for monotheism, for example, and, and uh, Carl Jaspers and other philosophers would say that it laid the foundation for modernity. We may be on the cusp of a second axial age. These challenges we're facing of such magnitude and so unusual in the history of this humans of our species that we can't actually imagine what the possibilities are for our response. There may be things that can happen to us in terms of uh, generating new perspectives on how we live together that we haven't conceived of yet. That's the possibility on which I build my hope in the book. But we're not going to be able to exploit those possibilities and of new worldviews and new ways of living together unless, unless we have tools such as cognitive effective mapping and others that, that I introduce that allow us to see what the possibilities are for new perspectives, to explore the landscape of new worldviews effectively. New ways of thinking. Exactly. Now, could you comment on the role of metaphor in changing our worldviews or conceptual maps and discuss further how we can influence 
others' deeply ingrained worldviews? So metaphor, metaphor is so powerful. It's one of the most, mm -hmm. most profound forms of human creativity. I can think of many, my mind is going in many directions right now, but um, there's one that I talk about explicitly in the book. Metaphors, as the cognitive scientist and philosopher George Lakoff would argue, many of them are universal in the sense that they are grounded in uh, very basic human experiences, uh, in, in physical engagements with our natural reality. So for instance, George Lakoff talks about, as we learn as babies, we experience the notions of inside and outside by taking a bowl or something like that and feeling the inside and seeing the outside. So we have this notion of container and that notion of container becomes a kind of metaphorical anchoring point for, uh, for instance, concepts of the nation or the group or the community. There's the inside and the outside of the community or of the nation. And so these metaphors can be very powerful and we then use, the, use them to structure our understanding of reality more generally. And a lot of them are universal. Lakoff would argue that something like the container metaphor is universal across all humankind. And I think that's probably true. What are some of the metaphors that would be part of this renew the future worldview? If you remember down at the bottom, I had a little oval with rebuild nature. I suggest that notion of nature that we're going to incorporate in our renew the future worldview that will be the antithesis to the Mad Max worldview that I argue should be the antithesis to the Mad Max worldview. That notion of nature is a highly relational notion of nature. It's a network, it's a web, two metaphors right there. Not unheard of, widely discussed, the web of nature, uh, the ecological nets and networks. Of course, people talk about these things all the time. But to a large extent, we haven't internalized those, under, those relational understandings of the natural world. And, and many of us still think of nature as something out there, that the uh, natural systems is out there and don't realize how profoundly dependent we are upon them for uh, services such as pollination, fluxes of nitrogen, carbon, and oxygen within our environment on which our societies fundamentally depend. Part of the sort of metaphorical foundation of the Renew the Future worldview is a profoundly relational understanding of our embeddedness in nature, that we are part of a network or of a web of connections around us. And if we destroy or tear apart that network or web, we're going to kill ourselves. We might think that's almost hackneyed now, but really that idea is relatively recent going back to, for instance, Rachel Carson, Carson in the 1960s and a few thinkers not long before uh, now it's quite widespread within certain communities, but its larger implications are not fully internalized by people. There are too many of human beings who still think of nature as a resource, nature as, as something to be exploited or extracted or used for our utility. I quote an indigenous leader in, uh, in my book who makes a very interesting point. He said, the world starts to look, look a lot different when elements of nature are around you you start to think of them, especially the living things, as relatives as opposed to resources. As soon as they're relatives, in that sense, as we think of relatives, uh, then we have some kind of moral bond with them and a relationship, again, systemic relationship that we need to protect. If they're resources, that moral bond doesn't exist and, we can, and they're dead material things that we can exploit for our purposes. So those shifts in meaning are really fundamentally important. There's a lot of evolution in that direction. The question is whether it's going to be fast enough to allow us to make the institutional and technological changes, to mobilize us to make the institutional and technological changes to do practical things like get our carbon up and down. Uh, I think it's happening. The question is whether it's going to happen fast enough. Right. Life of trees. Exactly, exactly, life of trees. All those connections under the surface. Right. Now here's a question from Ahmed uh, Safar, who says, I really admire the notion of hope you discussed today. I'm a new Canadian and my name is Ahmed. I belong to a Middle Eastern culture and I am non-religious. Because of my name and my place of birth in my Canadian passport, I've been facing many issues when it comes to my travel. I was treated poorly in airports, especially since the famous travel ban enacted in the US. My question is, with more than 70 million voting for Trump, do you think that there is a real hope for me and my kids who were born in Canada? I, as a gray haired white Canadian male, this is not my lived experience. And I have to start from that very important point. 
Sure, I've had lots of significant challenges. We won't get into those conversations. These are challenges that I can only imagine. Now, I happen to believe that empathy and our capacity for human imagination is very powerful, and we can actually do a good job of putting ourselves in each other's shoes. But I've never had this kind of experience that Ahmed experiences on a quite possibly a day-to-day -day basis. I think Canada is a somewhat more open-minded and tolerant society, but uh, it is very scary to see the expression of such enormous support for President Trump. And I hate to say it, but it's been pretty clear over the last few days as President Trump has tried to manipulate results in Michigan, in the Michigan electoral system, and tried to disenfranchise Detroit voters in particular, that a very profound impulse producing support for Trump and Trumpism in the United States is racism. It's an extraordinary fear of the other and of the normative change within society that will occur as there's this demographic shift and non-white communities become dominant within the United States, politically and socially and economically dominant. This is why I set up this kind of antithesis between two perspectives in the last part of the book. I argue that something resembling a Mad Max worldview is coalescing because of the stresses in our world, the economic and social and environmental dislocations, and the fear that those are generating and the exploitation of that fear by people like President Trump. And that Mad Max worldview is going to be there. It's going to engage a very large number of people, as we're seeing, in defense of their notion of the past and trying to prevent change to a new kind of future. The question then becomes, what is going to be the opponent, the opposite or the antithetical perspective or worldview to that Mad Max worldview? You don't have one worldview existing by itself. They, they tend to generate uh, oppositional worldviews. And the question is, what is going to be the most powerful antithesis that has a possibility of winning in the political struggle with the Mad Max worldview? Because it is, there's going to be a very profound political struggle, quite possibly a violent political struggle in the future between ethics and ideologies of division and violence and ethics and ideologies of community and cooperation uh, around our common problems. So I've tried to articulate what the basic elements of that alternative would be, but the, the election in the United States shows us that the other is not going to go away and is extraordinarily powerful and perhaps growing in power. That part of honest hope is recognizing that that's true and that's part of our reality. Okay, well, we have time for one short last question. Have you <laughs> had discussions with your children about these ideas that were, in, that, uh, were inspired by your concern for them? And what have they said? Wow. It's quite a question to end on. <laughs> the book starts with a story about Kate. She finds an article on my wife's desk, Sarah's desk. She's four years old. And the article is titled Impending State Change in, in Planetary System. It's basically a, a group of 20 or so ecologists have come together and studied when they think the world's ecosystems will flip from a productive into a highly degraded state based on their observations of individual ec ecosystems around the planet. They estimate that the threshold will be passed around 20, 2045. And so Kate asks Sarah, her mother, uh, what's the story about, mummy? She's four years old. And Sarah answers, well, darling, it's about how the world might change when you're a little bit older. Sarah goes back to her marking, feeling pretty crummy about this. And Kate turns over the paper and does a picture on the back of a flower growing in a landscape. And the flower has petals and it's got a big happy face on it. And then at the bottom is Kate, a little stick person waving at the viewer. So that picture appears in, in the first pages of the book because Kate is telling her own story about the future. And so that's the very opening vignette of the book. And in the end of the book, uh, there's another episode with Kate, which I won't get into right now. She asks me, at a point when she's very scared, she says, will this story have a happy ending? And it's a particular episode. She thinks her mother is lost and turns out everything's fine. And so I ask, what kind of story can I tell my children about the future? I say in these last pages that the book is really my story for them. It's my how about, as I call it. And when Ben and Kate were very young, they were always imagining possible worlds by starting their statement with, how about this? How about that? And so my book is my how about for Ben and Kate. And I talk about how I think they can have an extraordinary life during a very difficult time with a strong sense of identity and a sense of hero projects that will give their lives enormous meaning because 
everything is going to matter. This is a hinge moment for human history. And there are so many things to do to try to make things better. And we simply don't know enough about what the possibilities are in front of us to know that there is no hope. There's still vast un unexplored areas beyond the adjacent possible that could change things profoundly for human beings in a very positive way. And that's the story that I tell my kids. And the last thing I'll say, the book is dedicated to both of them. And when the books first arrived, I got a box and I pulled out the first two copies and I signed one to Kate and one to Ben and I handed the, handed the books to them and said, you know, you're not obliged to read this, but someday I hope that you will pick it up and take a look at it. I think perhaps in their 20s, they'll say, whoa, things aren't good. What, what did dad say about this? But at the moment, the books have uh, both gone up to their respective bedrooms. And I think they're sort of under piles of clothing, dirty clothing and stuff like that. So uh, they'll, be, they'll be dusted off at some point in the future. And I, I hope they'll be meaningful. I expect they will be. Thank you. Well, thank you, Thomas. I think those two children of yours are going to be very grateful that you dedicated this, this very hopeful book to them. I just want to say you, you, you had apparently once earned the nickname the Doom Meister for suggesting <laughs> that you were marching on a perilous road to environmental ruin, widespread political violence, and, and uh, devastating economic disparity if we didn't change our ways. But Tonight, you've really been courageous. I think it takes a certain amount of courage to do what you've done in suggesting that there is room for hope in the middle of this pandemic and everything else that we're facing, that we can actually command honest, astute, powerful hope that isn't hopey changey. Yeah, and, exactly. <laughs> and so we hope to read your book Thank and you. hope to act together collectively to achieve a, a desirable future. And, and it sounds as though we're going to have to be political about that. Absolutely. So uh, thank you so much. This was a wonderful way to end, uh, end our, our week of keynote addresses. Now we've put the link to two uh, bookstores, Audrey's books in Edmonton and Paige's books in Calgary. So that- Yay, like them both. And visited them many times. <laughs> <laughs> so that you can easily order a copy of Thomas's book. And in closing, uh, I would just like to say to our audience members, uh, we encourage you again to become a supporter of the Parkland so that we can continue to provide events like this and do the research and public education program we're so well known for. Clicking on the link in the chat is an easy way to provide your support and uh, no contribution, by the way, is too small. So we will also be sending out a, a survey after the conference and we look forward to hearing your feedback. It's very helpful to us. So we hope you are able to join us tomorrow for the Alberta Solutions Panel, which will explore all of the conference themes with six very dynamic Alberta speakers. So there you are. Thank you very, very much, all of you, and good night. <laughs>